I live for adventure. I've walked the Amazon, but there is so much of the world left to explore. This satellite imagery is bringing up crazy images from all over the planet, which I just cannot explain. And the only way to find out what is going on is to literally pick one, pack my bags and go there. It could be jungle, it could be desert, it could be Arctic. I've no idea how to get there or what I'll find. So I'm sure of a genuine adventure where anything can happen. I found a satellite image that has me intrigued. This one is deep in the mountains of eastern Siberia. Most of it looks very, very similar. It's forest, it's mountains, and yet there's what looks like a huge crater with a sort of conical shape within it, and then a further crater within that. It's in the middle of nowhere, it's extraordinarily remote. This marking does not make any sense. And I'm leaving tomorrow. Nine. <laughs> Over prepared, Ed? <laughs> I can't wait. At 5.30 in the morning, I meet cameraman James for the first leg of our journey. A short hop to Moscow. My target is in the wilderness of southeastern Siberia, not far from the village of Perevoz. But the nearest airport is 200 kilometers south in the small town of Bodaibo. And with no scheduled flights, we have to hitch a ride on a cargo plane. And we're going in <laughs> via the tail. It's not comfortable. It's, not comfortable. <laughs> it's exciting. Siberia is huge. It's over three quarters of Russia's land area. This place is so typically Eastern Bloc. It's almost like a set. I don't speak Russian, but I need to communicate to have any chance of making it to my target. I don't think I'll find any English speakers in a remote place like this, but I'm hoping that I might have some luck at the local school. I know you. <laughs> yeah, from Discovery Channel. Uh, are you with BR Bills? No? No, I'm not very ah, well. Um, There's a lot of people who obviously watch Discovery Channel here. Everyone seems to know me, which is very bizarre. The students give me a couple of leads, and a few hours later, I get a call from an English teacher called Ira. OK, so should we go to the statue of Lenin? Ira? Yes. How are you? Nice give me a hug. Oh, lovely to meet you. I, I think it's uh, the great chance uh, to practice my English, to communicate with you. The school holidays have just started, so Ira is free to work with me as a translator. Nice to meet you. Um, my name is Ed. Ed. Me and Luna. Nice to meet you. Olga. Olga. <laughs> Leonid and Olga welcome us with open arms. And not long after, an open bottle of vodka. There's a big crater, Padamsky. Padamsky crater. And I've seen it from an aerial photograph, and I'd like to see it with my own eyes and go and find it. It's a big energy there. Yeah. 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 Local legends claim that the crater is the nest of a giant fire eagle. Some believe it's cursed and that those who go there will die. These colorful stories make me even more determined to see it for myself. And at this time of the year, it's uh, very difficult. There is a lot of snow. OK. Over two meters. Right. Very difficult or impossible? Yeah. It's impossible. Okay. I understand that that is really steep, but this is less steep here. My God, that will be all right. You are crazy. Thanks, Leonid. Leonid wants to take me along the river as close as possible to the crater. Once I get to the drop-off point, I'll be on my own. So Leonid is keen to warn me that this region has Russia's highest concentration of brown bears. My plan is to bash up the hill and stay high, trekking six kilometers along the ridgeline before dropping into the valley that leads to the crater, 
and it's there that I'll camp for the night. From now on, I'll be totally on my own. Thanks, mate. <coughs> Siberia is being kind to me at the moment. The clouds have parted and the sun is out. This is the moment I've been waiting for. I'm heading into one of the coldest and most inhospitable places known to man. The last thing I wanted to do was push myself through snowdrifts again, but I have no choice. This is taking the person out. I think the skis are needed. Okay, they work, not too much as you know, on top of the snow. It's just taking a lot longer than I thought. I've only gone 400 meters in the last hour, and it doesn't help that I've got to keep stopping to do the filming. But I'm most worried about how my trusty mountain boots are going to cope with the snow. The leather is just now soaked and starting to freeze, and my feet are getting very cold. I'm only three kilometers from the crater, but progress is painfully slow, and my frozen feet feel like they've been hit by hammers. I can feel my uh, right toe throbbing. Frostbite is a massive concern. I must get my camp set up soon to survive the freezing nighttime temperatures. I'm at the foot of the very, very final ridge line that will take me up tomorrow morning to, um, to go and see the crater. So tonight, I'm gonna camp around here. Oh. Ah. Fire, 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 first thing. Small branches covered in lichen are an ideal fire starter. They've got very, very fine tinder and the smallest grade of kindling all in one. This is how you're meant to live in Siberia. I'm much happier making a fire and building a lean-to shelter than crawling into a nylon tent with only a little gas stove to keep me warm. All you really need is a lighter and an axe. This is the way to camp. That'll protect me from the wind, reflect back the heat of the fire so that I'm not just heated on one side, I'm heated on both sides. And that is warm underneath. Above my head, I need to close all of these gaps. Instead of filling the gaps with small branches, I'm using a heat blanket from my emergency survival kit. <laughs> it's a lot of work involved making a camp like this. So much fun. No. Temperature's dropped massively now outside. Um, outside, you're outside, Ed. <laughs> and as the sun disappears over the horizon, the camera lens starts to freeze over. <laughs> Extreme cold strikes in a heartbeat, and if you're not prepared, it can kill you. By nightfall, it's already minus 25 degrees. The sort of ominousness about this place is somewhat lifted by a fire. It makes you feel safe. It's Siberia, <laughs> and I'm sleeping outside. <laughs> Definitely have got frost nip on my toe. <laughs> frost nip, frost bite. That's me, out of chat. Um, turning off for the night. See you in the morning. In the night, the wind changed direction, blowing smoke into my shelter. Oh, I've slept some, I've slept some. Final ridge, um, three, four hundred meters, I think, straight up over the brow of the ridge. Crater should be there. 
That's good. My one objective is getting eyes on the crater. I reckon 300 meters was an underestimate. I've still got maybe 300 to go. Dropping down towards this target. Oh yes, that is a crater. Oh my goodness. Finding this crater on foot has been an adventure I'll never forget. Now I'm finally here. The feeling is indescribable. What looked intriguing on a satellite image is breathtaking in real life. Now that is satisfying. This huge white donut of rock in the middle of a vast landscape. It is so incongruous, and yet it is so magical, really. It must be over 150 meters across. Standing here, I see why it's inspired so many crazy stories. Who knows if this incredible crater will ever reveal its secrets. I don't know if I even want an answer. I'm just grateful for what the journey here has shown me all thanks to one intriguing image from space. Yes! <laughs> Geophysicists argue that the crater's donut shape rules out a meteor strike, and some rock samples that I took for analysis back this up. I'd have stayed longer, but I couldn't risk losing a toe. My frostbite will be a lasting reminder of this mysterious place in the heart of Siberia.